Our uh, next speaker is uh, Jennifer Scott. Again, uh, I'll refer you back to your uh, little handout here. There's a great bio on her. She's going to talk about uh, practical tips for Alzheimer's and dementia caregivers. Let's hear it for Ms. Scott. Thank you. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Good, it's nice to see everybody. I want to thank Riverbend and um, Alzheimer's Texas for having me out today to do a presentation. I'm going to start my little timer here so I don't go over. But um, make sure everybody can see up there. My name is Jennifer Scott. And I'm the director of the Area Agency on Aging and the Aging and Disability Resource Center in Austin. Anybody you heard of those two organizations in the room? Very good. Um, if you haven't, please be sure to come over to the table outside and learn about what we do. We have many different uh, services for family caregivers caring for a senior over the age of 60 or a person who is caring for somebody with Alzheimer's below the age of 60. So we have in-home respite. I heard somebody mention medications earlier. I want to make sure I mention that we have a free medication screening program that looks for um, negative drug interactions. So if you're concerned about your loved one's meds, we work with local pharmacists and we can do a free medication screening to spotlight if there are any um, negative drug interactions. And then you get a nice report. Again, my name's Jennifer Scott and I'm the director of the Area Agency on Aging and the Aging and Disability Resource Center. The Area Agency on Aging was, um, has been around for a long time. We provide services to um, folks over the age of 60, um, and it's all funded through the Older American Act of 1965, and it was signed by President Johnson, who is a, 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 our Texas president. So um, please be sure to come by and, and, and learn some more about what we do. I've got to figure out which one of these is going to work. Which way do I point it? Must be up there. There we go, yay, tell us if I hit the right button. I, I wanted to tell you a little about what my history is and why I'm so passionate about helping to um, educate folks on how to care for people who have Alzheimer's or related dementia. I started my career a long time ago, back in 90, 1984, and I was taking care of young children who had developmental disabilities. And back in 1996, the very first standalone Alzheimer's assisted living facility was built in Austin, and I was running some homes at the state school for people with developmental disabilities, and I needed a part-time job. And some friends of mine said, you need to go over and take a look at this new, uh, this new standalone Alzheimer's facility, which means it's not connected to a nursing home. And so I went over and they hired me and I became a personal care assistant to take care of people who have Alzheimer's disease. Didn't really know a lot about folks who had that illness at that particular time. Uh, I worked many, many nights, many, many weekends. I got snowed in there. Um, I did some cooking, I did housekeeping, I did all kinds of things with folks who have Alzheimer's disease. And I really made it a mission to learn as much about how the disease process is affecting people who have Alzheimer's disease as I can. It became a real passion of mine, and I changed my entire career based on that. I helped build some assisted livings here in town. I helped design some. I started a company with some investors to do that. I also went to the Alzheimer's Association for many years and um, was a uh, the program director for family education and stuff through an Alzheimer's Association in South Texas. So I've tried to learn as much as I can. Some of the things I'm going to say today may be a little bit difficult to hear. I would like to take a poll real quick. How many of you in this room are caring for somebody who has a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or related type of dementia? Raise your hands and keep them up high. I don't want anybody to look around the room. Okay. Okay, go ahead and put your hands down. How many of you have um, know of a friend or a neighbor or somebody else in your life that's not a direct loved one that has Alzheimer's disease or related dementia? Raise your hand. Okay. Go ahead and lower them. And how many in this room are diagnosed yourselves with Alzheimer's or related dementia? I know Dr. Nash and we've got a couple back there. Okay. Now I want everybody to raise your hand. Everybody who raised your hand before. Look around the room. That's every single person almost. That's staggering. The statistics of, of the number of people that would be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease is pretty, pretty staggering as we go forward in time uh, because of the baby boomers. 
and how we're all aging at the same time. And so Dr. Nash was talking about the research studies out there. What he was saying that we need people to enroll in the research studies is absolutely paramount. There are not enough people that are willing to put themselves out there, some because they're afraid to know whether or not they're going to get it or they already have it. But we need people to enroll in research studies because the number of people that are going to get diagnosed with this in the, in the near future is just absolutely staggering. So the more people that are enrolled, I'm a fairly young person. I'm in my 50s. I have already taken part in several different um, uh, research modalities to put myself out there to be able to do that uh, because I think every person can bring value to help, make a, to help bring a stop to this if there's any way possible. And it takes, it takes us humans to be able to make that happen. Okay, so some of the things I want to cover today. I do want to also preference that some of the things I might say today may be somewhat difficult. Uh, if you're caring for somebody who has Alzheimer's disease or related dementia. But I also want you to know that in all my experiences providing hands-on care for folks who have Alzheimer's, I have laughed, I have cried, I have hugged, I have had joy. I have just absolutely embraced that part of my life. And, um, and you, it, caring for somebody else, even if it's your loved one, which is very, very difficult, if you find the joyous moments in it, the road becomes a lot better. Okay, a lot better. Here's a couple of things I would like to cover today. One, to review how the frontal lobes affect the person's ability in order to help them care for themselves. When the disease process start, begins to affect the frontal lobes, I'm not going to use a lot of medical terms today because I don't think a lot of medical terms really help when it comes to how do you help somebody get dressed that no longer knows how to get dressed. How do you help somebody understand what's in front of them on the table when they no longer understand those things? Okay, so, but um, how does the frontal lobe affect the person? Uh, to identify maybe some ways to help do what's called ADLs, that's called activities of the daily living, easier, what can make it more successful for them to be able to do those things on their own, as well as you as a caregiver, how can you help them with directions that are going to help them to be successful with those things? Also discuss what kind of triggers, what's happening in the environment, and what's happening within them that may be, tri that may be triggering some behavioral issues that are associated with the disease process. You will hear me go out through the, throughout the day. I will rarely call anything a behavior problem because it's always going to be behavior that's associated with the disease process. Okay? If we look at things that like what could be the cause, we're not going to look at it as a problem. We're going to be looking for solutions instead. Also to discuss ways that we might be able to communicate with them in a, in a more effective way that makes them more successful and you more successful as a caregiver. So that's kind of what I'm hoping to get out of today. We've got a lot to cover and very little time to cover it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Alzheimer's disease. Vascular-related dementia, Dr. Nash mentioned that. That stroke-related dementia, also called multi-infarct dementia. Parkinson's-related dementia. Lewy body dementia. How many of y'all have heard of the word Lewy body dementia? Some of y'all? That's good. The awareness of that, of folks that have that illness is beginning to grow, which is, which is really good. Pick's disease, that's a frontal lobe dementia. And then Dr. Nash also mentioned that if people drink to excess, they can get what's called alcohol-related dementia. That is called the uh, Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. So I'm going to talk about some of the differences between these just in a very, very high-level way. So Alzheimer's disease begins with a very, very slow progression over time. In the beginning, when somebody has it, they may not even recognize it, and their loved ones may not recognize that something is going on. Very, very slow progression over time. And in first, what family caregivers use, and I've hosted um, support groups. I have also hosted um, early stage support groups through the Alzheimer's Association in my, in my past experience with the South Central Texas um, Association out of San Antonio, that it's a very, very slow progression. And, and, and sometimes you can, there's just a little warning sign that something's wrong, but then there can be months and days when you can't tell something is, is really wrong. Family caregivers tell me quite a bit that mom or dad has, a, has great days, and you really can't say, and they can have a conversation with a friend or a loved one on the phone, and they can't tell anything's wrong at all. And so in the beginning, it's, it's almost like riding a wave. There's good days, bad days. There can be months in between, and then the longer they have the illness, 
the more frequent those more confused moments begin to happen. So it's a very slow progression over time. Short-term memory is typically affected first. I want to preface this with you can have two people diagnosed with the disease, Alzheimer's disease. There's going to be commonalities, but, not, but both people with the disease may not decline in the exact same way or at the same pace. Okay, so some of the things I'm talking about, some people might begin to have, some might not. There's just generalities. Okay, so short-term memory begins to affected, become affected first. That's our ability to call recent events, things that happened a couple weeks ago, things that happened last year, and then eventually things that what happened this morning. What did they have for breakfast? That happens fairly late. Okay, but even knowing what they did five, ten minutes ago becomes distorted. Short-term memory. They begin to have difficulty with um, executive functioning skills. And when I say that, I ask the crowd, what do you think an executive functioning skill is? And I do a presentation for many professional caregivers too. And that's the term that they hear is executive functioning skills. So what's amazing to me is a lot of people don't know what an executive functioning or how does that apply to the person? What does that really mean? And so some of the things I'm going to talk about later are going to talk about those types of executive functioning skills. Eventually, fairly late in the disease process, even their long-term memory becomes distorted. Some of the folks that I've cared for, if I ask them, where did you work? They might be able to tell me the name of the place that they worked, but couldn't tell me what they actually did for that particular business. Or they could tell me what they did, but could not remember what the name of the business is. Or they knew that they were born in Kansas, but couldn't remember the actual city um, where they were born. So even in, the, in a much later down the road, the long-term memories become distorted too. Now that's difficult for family caregivers. That's extremely difficult for an adult child caring for a parent. And that becomes difficult because sometimes they can't recall all of the children that they've had. Sometimes they think they have three kids when they might have four. Sometimes they think they have five kids when they only have two. So even the long-term memories become, become, become distorted. And there's, it's, it's just the way it is. Okay? And then eventually people may begin to develop what's called a loss of motor skills. That's our ability to be able to ambulate. They might get a shuffling gait. They might be able to, they might be having difficulty reaching out and grabbing and picking up things. Um, so loss of motor skills, their ability to tell their body how to move is basically what that calls. Then the, another common type is what's called vascular dementia. Folks that have vascular dementia may decline a little bit differently than somebody who has Alzheimer's disease. People that have vascular dementia or stroke-related dementia, they may be stable in their skill level for a long time. And then they have a little mini stroke called a TIA. And then their skill level may drop very rapidly. Like going from being able to um, dress themselves to all of a sudden in a flash not being able to do that. But then they might stabilize again. So their decline is much more of a stair-stepping. Compared to somebody who has Alzheimer's disease, typically it's a much slower decline over, could be many years. Okay, so it's a little bit different. People who have vascular dementia may lose the ability to know when they need to use the restroom and be able to identify those signals sooner than somebody who has Alzheimer's disease. It's one of the differences. They may also begin to develop language difficulty sooner than somebody who has Alzheimer's disease in, in the progression. Uh, their words may become more jumbled. Um, it's called aphasia, where their words that they're using don't make sense, or they're using different words than the words than you and I use. They become a little bit more distorted. They may also become what's called wheelchair dependent sooner than somebody who has Alzheimer's disease. So they might lose the ability to ambulate and walk a little bit sooner in the disease process than somebody who has Alzheimer's disease. So those are some of the difference there. Then there's Parkinson's dementia. That's a re regular body movements that they can't control. They get stiff in the, in the limbs and in the joints sometimes. Folks that have Parkinson's tend to have a difficulty time sitting down because they get stiff in the legs. So I teach staff that if you've got somebody with Parkinson's that are having difficulty walking, just touch the next limb. They need to move. Sometimes that helps them move that next limb. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it can help somebody stay ambulatory longer in the illness. They're trying to reach out and pick up their cup from the table and they get stuck help just by touching that limb. And sometimes that sends the signal, sometimes it doesn't, but it can help people maintain their independence a little bit longer. People that have Parkinson's disease will also get motor skill difficulties, just like folks who have Alzheimer's do sometimes in the later stages. Uh, and then there are different schools of thought. 
Uh, the Parkinson's Association says about 30 to 40 percent of people that have Parkinson's also develop a dementia, like Alzheimer's disease, or a cognitive loss. Alzheimer's Association says it's up to 40 to 50 percent. What we do know is that a good portion of people that have Parkinson's may also develop memory and cognitive loss as a result of the illness. Then there's Lewy body dementia. Lewy body dementia. And I'm glad that a lot of people raise their hands that are, that are understanding Lewy body dementia because we do think that it might be underdiagnosed, but it's very difficult to diagnose as well. Okay, but people who have Lewy body dementia typically will um, hallucinate. Does anybody know what a hallucination is? Right, that seeing something, hearing something, feeling something, tasting something, or smelling something that nobody else does. It's called a hallucination. People who have Alzheimer's disease sometimes can do the same thing. They can hallucinate. But usually that's like episodic. It's because of medication drug interaction or an infection, like a urinary tract infection uh, um, or something of that nature. People that have Lewy body dementia tend to, to live in a constant state of hallucination. They see things and hear things a good portion of the time. I've had it described to me. I took care of a couple of folks that had Lewy body dementia that were younger in life. I had one person that lived in my assisted living that had Lewy body dementia, and his, he would see little animals, little critters in the middle of the room, and he would say, hallucination alert, hallucination alert. And that's how he was telling us that I'm seeing something, and I don't know if it's real or not. And people who have Lewy body dementia, too, tend to see little children. Okay, little children. They're the ones that will say, look at those cute little kids playing outside my window. What are they doing out there? Or what are those cute little kids doing in my bed or in the bottom of my closet? So they tend to see little, little children, not all of them. The reason why I'm telling you some of this is because if you're loved ones, it's so that you, if you're seeing some of these things, you can talk to their doctor about it. Okay, because the main way it's diagnosed is through some of these signs and symptoms. Okay? They also might develop what's called pseudo-Parkinson's-like symptoms, which isn't real Parkinson's, but they think, the doctors think they have Parkinson's, and so they get put on a Parkinson's medication, and the signs and symptoms of their skills and abilities decline quickly. They might go from being able to ambulate or walk to not being able to walk, because it's not real Parkinson's-like syndrome. Okay? They also have very rapid, rapid cognitive decline. Remember I was saying that folks that have Alzheimer's, may decline very slowly over time, and it's so slow, and if you're a family caregiver, sometimes you become a complete caregiver without even knowing about it because it's so insidious. You take on little bits here and little bit there, and you start doing this and you start doing that. Next thing you know, you're caregiving 100% of the time, right? People that have Lewy body dementia can, can have very big vacillations in their cognition. You can be having a conversation with them, there's no confusion, and then boom, all of a sudden there's a, a great de uh, deal of, con of confusion, even in the middle of that conversation. One of the ways that they diagnose Lewy body dementia is what's called syncope episodes. Any nurses in the room? Anybody in here a nurse? Those are fainting spells. Okay, and that can begin to happen fairly early in illness. So they rule out what's called orthostatic hypertension, which is going from a seated to standing position, and the blood pressure drops and then people can pass out. That's very common as we get older. Um, so they rule out all those things that could be causing fainting spells because folks who have this illness all of a sudden lose consciousness and we don't, still don't know why, but it is one of the ways that they diagnose it. Here's the main reason why I'd like to talk about Lewy body dementia and why I think it's so important. People that have Lewy body dementia have an absolute intolerance to the psychotropic medications. Okay, things that treat scary hallucinations, for example, delusions or fixed manifestations where they think something's real that's not real, and they get very task-driven about that. Many times those things are treated with psychotropic medications to reduce the probability of scary types of hallucinations. Folks that have this disease will have an opposite effect to those medications. It will make them worse. It, their skill level will decline. So that's another way that the signs and symptoms may tell the doctor that they may be dealing with something like a Lewy body dementia or a combination thereof. Okay, but that's the big one. So if everything you try with your loved one, medication-wise, is making it worse, have a conversation with the doctors about that, okay? Folks that have a diagnosis of Lewy body dementia, you really have to look about what's going on in the environment. What can you change in the environment that might be upsetting them? Is it too loud? Is it too crowded? Are too many people talking to them all at the same time? 
those kinds of things. So you have to look at what can you change about the things going on around them rather than using medications. And you have to become very, very educated for yourselves as a family caregiver or a caregiver of somebody else about how Lewy body and all of these disease processes really are going to affect your loved one. Okay. Then there's Pick's disease. That's all frontal temporal type of uh, disease process. Um, in, your in your handouts, I go into everything that's on this slide. Um, people can get diagnosed with it much younger in life in their 40s and 50s, sometimes a little bit younger. Uh, uh, they may put everything in their mouth. You have to be really careful if you have a loved one that has Pick's disease. The youngest person I cared for that had Pick's disease was 46. And we had to be very careful because even um, objects that are not safe to, to go in the mouth ended up in the mouth. So you have to take real special precautions if somebody has Pick's disease. They might develop what's called gluttonous eating. The brain no longer tells their, their stomach, I'm full. And so they'll eat, neat, neat, neat. Um, uh, and they may have very extreme language loss in the very end stages of the illness. People who have Alzheimer's disease will continue to communicate with you well into the disease process, all the way through the disease process. Even if you don't understand the words, all behavior has meaning. That if you walk away with one thing today, I want you to recognize that all behavior has meaning and every sound has a meaning. Okay, so maybe folks that are in the very late stages that you're caring for or that live in a care facility may make sounds like na, 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 or help, 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 help. That's still communicating. That's saying, I need you. I need something. And so everything has meaning. Okay, people that have um, Pick's disease tend to become mute. They no longer use words, but their behavior will talk to you. Here's the alcohol-related dementia. I really like to spotlight that because we can prevent this. Excessive alcohol intake can cause this. If somebody gets diagnosed with this, it's irreversible, just like if somebody has Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so there are things that we can do to not get alcohol-related dementia. Uh, confabulation, if you want to know what that is, people that have alcohol-related dementia tend to make up the facts a lot. So can people who have Alzheimer's disease, because if you can't remember all of the facts, you may make them up. People who have alcohol-related dementia make it up quite a bit. It's like I was a rocket scientist when they were never a rocket scientist, you know, those kinds of, those kinds of things. Okay, it causes some muscle wasting. Uh, no matter how good their diet is, they will become thin at the extremities. And here's the thing to know about people who have alcohol-related dementia. In some folks, physical touch begins to hurt. Okay, there's neuropathy. There's neuropathy for folks that are diabetic where you can't, they lose a feeling in their feet. There's also a neuropathy that is a heightened sensation on the skin sensations. And it can actually, that physical touch can become harmful to them. Um, so when you're trying to help care for them and change their clothes, when you're touching them, they may be the ones that are really pushing your hands away because that physical touch becomes um, very sensitive for them. So it's something to remember. Okay? Sometimes folks that have alcohol-related dementia um, can be quite behaviorally involved, sometimes difficult to care for um, because of all the behaviors that are associated with the illness. They will also do much better in a smaller setting, not a large group activity setting. They tend to be a little bit more of a loner, so that's important to know. Okay. So Alzheimer's disease really begins in a part of the brain that kind of helps our short-term memory function, but it doesn't stay there. It, it begins to travel to more of the frontal lobes of the brain. I just call them up here, frontal lobes of the brain, right? And it's our frontal lobes of our brain. Many of the things I'm going to talk about now are some of the first things that family members have told me that they begin to recognize as something's wrong with their loved one, okay? That these are the things that they begin to see. So it's our frontal lobes that allow us to think in abstract concepts, which I want you to think about is everything that we learn growing up, who, whoever raised us, almost Everything is an abstract concept, okay? How do you tell time on a watch? Are we born knowing how to do that? And if you're telling time on a watch, is it 1025 in the morning or is it 1025 in the middle of the night? Is it two o'clock in the middle of the afternoon or two o'clock in the middle of the morning, right? Clothing, one of the first things people will say to me sometimes, I've taken thousands of helpline calls when I was with the Alzheimer's Association and at the Area Agency on Aging, we have an information referral line. So we help many, many fam family caregivers get down this road. 
Um, but they'll say, mom is no longer dressing the way that she used to dress. Mom's clothes aren't matching anymore. Or maybe this will ring a bell. Mom's not wanting to change her clothes. Has anybody experienced that? Mom refuses to change her clothes. She wears the same clothes over and over and over again. Okay? So it's an abstract concept to know whether something is clean or dirty. It's also an abstract concept to know if whether or not you've got your shirt on frontwards or backwards, or if you've got your pants on correctly, or if your skirt goes on the outside of your skirt or on the inside of your skirt. So many times, family caregivers will say, I've noticed a change in the way my loved one is dressing. And that's part of the abstract concept thinking difficulties. Natural consequences. One of the early warning signs people say is that people begin to put things in places where they don't really belong. You might find food in a cabinet that's supposed to be in the refrigerator. Anybody experience that? Okay, where well you find things where they just don't quite go right. So natural consequences is if, if I do this, the following's gonna happen, right? If I put my milk in the cabinet and drink it, what's gonna happen? I'm gonna get sick, okay? So natural, and there's many, many, many different types of natural consequences. Think about how many there are out there. And what I hear sometimes and what I caution against is when somebody's having a behavioral issue associated with the disease process, sometimes the, the caregivers, whether they're professional or, or a home caregiver, a family caregiver will say, mom or dad or Jim or Bob, if you do that again, I'm going to do X. Well, that's a natural consequence. And if there's a disease process caught, taking away a person's ability to understand those natural consequences, a lot of times those interventions don't work very well. Okay, because one, you have to be able to recall what the intervention will be for it to be effective. And if somebody has very little short-term memory left, can't recall new stuff going in, because there's a disease process that's stopping that from happening, the natural consequence um, as a result of a behavior typically won't work. Okay. So other natural consequences, uh, I want to talk about driving for a second and safety issues, okay? Driving and safety issues. As a family caregiver, some of the most difficult decisions to make, what are the first two things, two big decisions usually family caregivers have to step in on? Car and what else? Where they're living, can they live alone? But even before then sometimes. What about money? Right? What are the two things that we equate to independence in our life? Being able to drive down that road, go wherever we want to go, when we want to go there. Right? And what's the other thing? Our ability to say, I want that and I want to go buy it. Okay, but driving, there are so many safety issues related. Not everybody that has Alzheimer's, it does not not mean right away take away those car keys, but there are some things that you can do to monitor their safety about it. When you're driving, there's many, many different abstract concepts that it takes. Not just knowing what the difference between your gas pedal and your brake pedal is and how to steer your car down the road. So if it's raining outside, what do you have to turn on? Your windshield wipers. If it's 104 degrees outside, how do you turn on your air conditioner? How do you know when your gas tank is full or empty? What's the difference between a yield sign and a stop sign? At a four-way stop, who's got the right of way? What's the difference between a white line in the middle of the road and a yellow spotted line? Yellow dot, there are many, many safety and abstract concepts that requires people to have those abilities when they're driving, okay? So if your loved one is still driving, it doesn't mean take the car keys away right away. But there are some things. There is a place here um, through St. David's that has kind of a driving evaluation, okay, that your loved one can go through to make sure that they're still safe driving. Okay, so abstract concepts. Television, people in a much later stages of the illness, very late in the stages when the disease is quite advanced, may begin to think what they hear and see on that TV is real. Okay, some of the things you might begin to see is they'll begin to talk to the TV. Like the person's really there because it's an abstract concept to know that what you see and what's happening in that box is not really happening in your world. Now, I like to, when I talk about the TV, I like to say one thing. When you have your loved one in the hospital for a fall or a urinary tract infection or something like that, 
and if, they, uh, if, they, if they're fairly advanced down the road of Alzheimer's disease, be careful with the TV, because where's the TV in a hospital room? Up there, and where's the speaker? It's usually on the arm now, or it's on a speaker thing pinned to the pillow, right? And it's an abstract concept to know that what's happening behind here and the talking I'm hearing is connected to that up there. And sometimes they may begin to think that the bed's talking to them. And one of the issues in the hospital is they don't want to stay in the bed. They don't know why they're there. And they try to get up. Okay, so I suggest you take a music box up with you, play some music that they enjoy, not lots of words, and try to eliminate the TV. You're only going to know whether that's going to work or not work with your loved one. Again, those are all generalities. But the, what you want to do is reduce the probability of them having to be restrained when they're in the hospital because they're afraid they're going to get up and fall and break a hip. So there's all kinds of things that you can do if they're in the hospital for, for an emergency. So abstract concepts. It's also our frontal lobes that give us the ability to think in multi-step tasks. Things that take many, 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 many steps to accomplish. I need a volunteer that's coming up. Will you come up here for just a second? I knew you would. Okay. okay. I want to give you an example of a task that we do every single day, every day, that's multiple steps. Okay. You're sitting in your living room. You don't have Alzheimer's. Don't overthink this at all. Okay. And I go, Amelia, go to your bathroom and brush your teeth and just walk me through that. Don't overthink it. Just do it like you would today. Just brush your teeth. Brush your teeth? Yeah. Okay. Up and down. Up and down. Circles. Up in circles. Spit out the toothpaste. Spit the toothpaste out. Rinse the toothbrush. Rinse the toothpaste. Put it back. And put it back. Done. Done in about six different steps. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> She did that in about six steps. Now, she's in her living room, and somebody asked her, go to your bathroom and brush your teeth, or just go brush your teeth. What's the first thing you have to know? Where the bathroom is. Nope. What does it mean to brush your teeth? What are your teeth? What does it mean to brush your teeth? That's an abstract concept. And if they know what it means to brush their teeth, then they have to go, okay, I'm not in the right room to get that done. So then they, and if they're in a seated position, they have to know how to go from a seated to a standing position. Then they have to know which room they have to find. One of the family, what family caregivers tell me a lot is they begin to become confused in familiar places. They have difficulty finding the rooms in the houses where they've lived for a long time, where the bathroom is. So if they're trying to brush their teeth and you say, mom, dad, Jim, Bob, whoever it is, go brush your teeth, they have to know how to go from a seated to standing position, know what it means to brush their teeth, what's the right room, and if they make it to the right room, how do I turn on my light? What's the difference between my toothbrush and my hairbrush? What's the difference between my toothpaste and my shaving cream? How do I turn on the hot water and adjust the cold water? How do I get the stuff in this tube out of the tube and onto this toothbrush? How do I brush my teeth? Up here, down here? Do I swallow the toothpaste? Do I spit it out? How do I turn the water back off? Etc. Toothbrushing is about 42 steps. But all of those steps we learn growing up, and we don't have to think about all of them. All we do is we get up and we go do it. Because our brain takes over. Okay? And it's our frontal lobes that allow us to do those things. So if you think there's lots of steps in toothbrushing, think about how many steps there are in bathing. Right? How many steps there are in bathing? How many steps there are in cooking? All of those things that we have to do every day to take care of ourselves. And here's what happens. A lot of times, we ask them to do many of their personal care stuff all at the same time. In the later stages, okay, mom, dad, Jim, Bob, or whatever, it's time to get up. Let's go take off your night clothes. Let's brush your teeth. Let's put on your clean clothes. Let's go eat. And all of a sudden, oh, you have food on your clothes. Now we're going to go back and we're going to do it all over again. And by the time they do all those things, either there's, they're, they're not very happy or they're really tired. Okay, so we tell people break things down into small steps, but the error in that sometimes is we're breaking them down into the small steps that we think about being not impaired. You have to be thinking about how can I break those things down to even smaller steps? Because what happens as a family caregiver when you ask mom or dad, go brush your teeth, and this is what happens. Mm -hmm. 
How long do you think that was? 10, 15 seconds? A little bit longer? And the person hasn't done what you've asked them to do. So what do you do? You ask them to do it again, and you might ask them the exact same way. Mom, it's time to go brush your teeth. And the person does this. By the time you've asked three or four times as a caregiver, what are you? Frustrated, okay? If you're a professional caregiver that works in a community or a facility, guess what happens? That goes on the tracking sheet, refused. You know what happens if you get a lot of refusals? Meds, okay? Sometimes medications. When sometimes that is not what's going on, they don't understand the very first thing you ask them to do. That's when it comes down to being able to communicate and really breaking things down into small steps for them. Okay, so toothbrushing, eating, bathing, dressing. Now here's the key. Remember I was saying sometimes it's like this. What they can do for themselves sometimes in the morning is different than what they can do in the late afternoon. Okay, so you have to judge as a caregiver on, on, on based on that moment and what's gonna work in that particular moment. Because what works today may not work tomorrow, but it may work again the next day, okay? It's also our frontal lobes that gives the ability to rationalize and reason, to see other people's point of view, um, to know if something is true or false. How many of you guys have a loved one that has this illness that are fairly advanced in the disease process? Raise your hand. If they think something is true, does any amount of arguing with them work to convince them differently? Is that a yes or no? That's a no. How many people does it take to argue? Two. It is a lot easier for us to change as caregivers our behavior and not get involved in that. There's so many things that we just don't need to argue over with them. If they think the sky's green, it doesn't have to be blue. It can be, it can be green. You know? we fi I find that we tend to correct without really even realizing that we're correcting, especially if it's a loved one of ours, because we really don't want to see our loved ones fail. And so what we do is if mom or dad is reaching out for the sugar shaker when they're really meaning the salt shaker, we go, mom, no, that's not the sugar, that's the salt. Well, that's a correction. Yeah. Personality is our frontal lobes. That's our ability to, uh, um, and these are very subtle, loss of emotional control, happy, sad, anger, dealing with changes. Sometimes folks that have this illness used to be might have been really laid back and dealt with changes all of their life, but all of a sudden you begin to see a change and small changes in their routine begin to upset them. Has anybody experienced that? Okay. Changes in routine can be more upsetting for them than normal, than what you're used to. Um, I've also had family caregivers that go, my mom has just been an angry person all of her life and it was really hard to get, a get along with, but now we just have a great time. You know, so it just completely depends. So personality changes. It's also in our frontal lobes that give us the ability to have impulse control. That's really an important thing. Impulse control is our ability to stop and think about consequences and stop and think about um, how our actions and our words are gonna make other people feel, okay? And if we have something that's impairing that ability, then we may say some things that are not so nice, okay? We may do things that might be considered aggressive types of behaviors which I do not like the word aggression in relation to people who have Alzheimer's and related dementia. Because in order to really be aggressive towards somebody, you have to be able to plan and implement and say, you just made me mad and I'm gonna get you back for that. What often happens is you just did something that really frightened me and I want it to stop. I need for it to stop. There's a big difference between those two things, between being aggressive and saying I'm frightened and I'm gonna do whatever I have to do to make that stop, okay? So yelling sometimes, you'll see folks that have this illness, aggressive type behaviors, saying the first things that's on their mind. I've been called everything. I've been called short. I used to be much heavier, so I was called fat. All different kinds of things. Um, I've also been called some really wonderful things. Really, really wonderful things. Um, so you, I always call, if you're a family caregiver, you have to put on your caregiving shield. How many of y'all taking care of a loved one Maybe they said something to you that really stung. Raise your hand. Somebody really said something. Look at how many hands went up. Leave your hands up for a second. Everybody look around the room. 
I just want you guys to show, show you that you are not alone, okay? So you know what I call? Who, who's familiar with Star Trek? Anybody familiar with Star Trek? We're all about the right age to know Star Trek, right? I believe if you're a family caregiver, put on your caregiving shield. Literally a metaphor, <laughs> right? Just cover yourself with that shield and you don't have to let the words stick. Don't let the words bounce right back off of you, okay? Just like you have a force shield on, okay? Really important to be able to do that. Don't let those words stick, okay? So saying the first thing that's on their mind, sometimes folks that have this illness, if they're living in a communal situation, such as an assisted living or a nursing home, or in your own home, they might reach over and you have a piece of pie in front of you and they've already eaten their piece of pie and they go, hmm, look, there's a piece of pie and I certainly like that piece of pie and they reach over and grab your pie. Anybody experienced that? Not yet? You have? Okay. So they might, what we call, borrow other people's. I call it window shopping sometimes. Okay, especially if they're living in a communal environment, they might go, they might see a red jacket that's in the living room and they used to have a red jacket and all they know is I'm cold and they're like, look, there's a red jacket and on goes the red jacket. Family caregivers sometimes think that's that somebody else living in that environment stealing from them. But you know what? In order to steal something, what do you have to know? What's yours and what's not yours, right? You have to know that what I'm doing is I'm taking something that doesn't belong to me in order to steal it. In our folks in the later stages, they're not gonna, they're not gonna recognize that. Okay, so it's really important not to label those things. So I call it window shopping because you might walk in if your loved one lives in a community or facility or in your own house. They might have on, a wife may come in and the husband's in her pantyhose. I've seen it happen. Okay, or in their coat or something like that, okay? Here's the thing I want you to know about. The, many of the words that we use are abstract words, okay? There are two words in the English language that are definitely abstract. I want you to think about the word appropriate and inappropriate, right? If somebody's behaving, behaving inappropriately, that means they're doing something that's against maybe societal norms. Does that make sense? Okay? But in order to understand what's inappropriate versus appropriate is all an abstract concept. And many times we label folks that have this illness as being appropriate or inappropriate. So we're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. And we say, what you're doing is inappropriate. I need for you to stop. Well, that word inappropriate may not mean what it needs to mean to them. Okay, so be thinking about the words that you're using because they may not understand when you're trying to say, I really need for you to stop that. It's a lot easier to say, you know what, let's not do that, let's do this instead, okay? Okay, so um, taking and borrowing items. Initiation is also in the frontal lobes. That's our ability to start things. Say, I want to do X, now what do I have to do in order to do it? I need to start it. So what ends up happening is sometimes people will say, mom used to do, she used to do needlepoint all the time. I'm just throwing out some examples. She used to do needlepoint, I go home and she'd be needing needlepoint, now she doesn't do that. I find her and she's just sitting. Or mom says she's hungry, and I say, did you go get something from the kitchen? No, because it's the ability to initiate things, to start things. Sometimes we think that's depression, and it very well might be. You've got to talk to the doctor to make sure that's not what it is. But sometimes it's because the illness has taken away their ability to start the things that they want to do or need to do. Um, changing clothes when dirty, fixing something to eat, and participating in activities is also um, um, their ability to initiate things. Okay, empathy is in the frontal lobes. Again, that's understanding how our, effect, uh, our actions affect others. To put themselves in someone else's shoes and knowing, what, knowing that other people are doing things for them. Uh, I've had family caregivers who have had to quit work to stay home and care for a mom or a dad or a spouse or something like that. And sometimes they don't get a whole lot of thank yous from the person or the person they're caring for doesn't recognize how much it's really taking, right? And sometimes that can cause some real resentment on the part of the family caregiver because they're like, mom just doesn't understand everything I'm doing for her. I want you to recognize that the illness itself may be taking away your loved one's ability to recognize that. That is not a purposeful thing, okay? That's not a purposeful thing. Ability to um, stay on task, attention to task. 
um, becomes distorted the farther down the road of the illness they become. How many of you as family caregivers have, let's say, had taken whoever you're caring for, you take them into the kitchen, you have them sitting down to a meal, and then you have to get up and go do something and leave the room. And all of a sudden, the person that you're caring for gets up away from the table and follows you. Got a hand back there, anybody else? Or how many of y'all have tried to go to the bathroom and the person you're caring for comes knocking on the door? Does that sound familiar to anybody? Okay. That's called shadowing behavior, by the way. Many family caregivers, because everywhere you go, they go. It's like you're a giant environmental cue. They're going to follow you. They're looking to you and for whatever you're doing to tell them what they need to do, and it's called shadowing behavior. And sometimes family caregivers are afraid to reach out and ask for help because they don't think that their loved one's going to adjust to somebody else helping them. That shadowing behavior does transfer to the next to another person. Okay, so don't be afraid to ask for help, and don't be afraid to get respite, to find some respite opportunities for yourself to get a break. Okay? So what can we do to make some of these things better? Dressing, here's some of the things I suggest. Use one clothing at a time, okay? Here's a green shirt and a blue shirt, which one? Here's two pairs of pants, which one? How many of y'all have ever gone to a restaurant and the restaurant's menu has 16 pages to it? And there are at least 20 different chicken dishes, 14 pasta dishes. Does that sound familiar? And what do you end up doing? You get a hamburger, you get the most familiar thing, you close your eyes and you point. Or you ask the server, what do you recommend? And what does the server tell you? They give you three options usually, a chicken, a beef, and a fish, right? Or if it's a pasta, you know, three different times. And so they've narrowed down your choices for you, right? It makes it much easier to choose. You know, people that have this illness sometimes, not all of them, but sometimes do what's called layering their clothes. Anybody familiar with that? That's putting on multiple shirts and multiple pairs of pants. I had one particular gentleman, love him to death, cute as a button. He loved baseball caps. So his baseball caps are all lined up on a shelf in his room, and he'd come out, and all his baseball caps were on his head. <laughs> because what happens is if they're looking in their entire closet, they say, look, there's a pair of pants, and they put those on. They look in their closet, look, there's a pair of pants. Oh, I should put those on. Oh, look, there's another pair of pants. <laughs> Same thing with their shirts and everything. So sometimes that leads to the layering. But you don't want to take away people's choice. I don't want people to take away my choice. So the key is, is to just give them fewer choices so that they're more successful in choosing. Now let's say they choose a purple pair of pants and a bright pink shirt you've offered. When they, you offered them things that match, does it really matter whether or not their clothes match? Right? Here's something that I want to impart. It's, I mean, just put it in your back pocket if you need to. You might need it later, right? Out of family caregivers that I have helped get down this road with their loved ones, sometimes their loved ones begin to do things differently than they remember them ever doing. They begin to dress differently than they've ever dressed before. Maybe there's a dad that was always clean shaven, right? Always. You never knew your dad with a beard, and you never thought your dad would want a beard. But all of a sudden, he has this illness, and shaving becomes painful. Or they don't understand why that is important to shave or why that they're shaving. Okay? So trying to get him to do that every single day becomes very difficult for them and upsetting to them, to that particular person. Or maybe they always wore a belt. You've never seen your dad without a belt. And so you talk to the caregiver, and you're like, I really want dad to have a belt, or he really needs to be shaved every day. Well, if that's a battle every day, I want you to consider whose need is it to, for dad to be shaved? Is it his need to be shaved? If it's kept clean, well-trimmed, not yanking, not tugging, or is it you, the family caregiver, whose mental picture of your dad doesn't need to change? So whose need is it? So sometimes you have to be thinking about those kinds of things, about really identify, is it, is it, is it me that I need things to be this way, or, or does my loved one really need them to be this way? Okay, difficult things to think about. Not, not easy to, to think about. Okay, so one clothing at a time, small step instructions, demonstrate modeling. Sometimes, I'm gonna give you an example of why that's really important. Sometimes we might have folks that go outside in their heavy coat and it's 110 degrees outside. 
right? And you say, it's really hot outside, I need you to take your coat off. And they refuse. So you go get a coat and go, man, I'm really hot, I'm going to take my coat off. And they're going to role model what you do. Okay, in my communities and facilities, we used to have little light jackets and stuff like that hanging around. So if they had on something that was going to really cause them to overheat, we would ask them for swaps. Here, let me give you this light jacket, or let me put that one in the laundry for you, and you can wear this one instead. So you can do swaps and that kind of thing. Okay? But uh, demonstration modeling, avoid things that go over the head. That can be frightening for folks. Uh, clothing that's easy to put on. Some of these things are for folks that, are really, that, that, that need a lot of assistance to do these things. So you want to find ways that they're going to be as successful as they can be. Velcro, when it comes to eating one utensil at a time, don't clutter the table. Tablecloths that are opposite colors of the plate so that they can see the plate against the tablecloths, really important. Some folks that have this illness begin to lose the ability to see things in what I call 3D space. It's called visual agnosia. Everything begins to look flat to them. You'll know that's happening if they go to set something like this on the table. Like they're water on the table and they miss the table. Okay, or they go to sit in a chair and they look at the chair and they see it and they go to sit down and they miss the chair. You'll also know it if they are walking and um, uh, there's two different, like say, surfaces, like a carpet and then a wooden floor. If they're having a visual issue with that, they'll go like this over those transitions. Or when they're trying to go up and down steps, like up and down curbs, they'll way overstep those curbs. That's telling you that they're having some depth perception issues. So colored plates against dark uh, tablecloths can really help them identify what's in front of them. Plain tablecloths, smaller plates, reduced table clutter. Toothbrushing, we went through that a little bit. Only have the items that they need to use on the counter. So it's easy for them to locate them and find them. Okay? Um, unclutter vanity, bathing. Bathing sometimes, getting folks to bathe is one of the most difficult things in caregiving sometimes. Anybody experienced difficulty with bathing? Okay. If you have water going over your head, what do you have to know? To close your eyes and to hold your breath. And what kind of concepts are those? Abstract, okay? So sometimes it's, they become frightened because all they know is that I've got this going over my head and I don't know what to do with it, okay? So bathing can be, and here's, some people might agree with this, some people might not. There's no written rule that in order to get somebody completely clean, you have to fully submerge them in water, okay? Many of the, the, the generation of folks that we're caring for now in their, in their 80s and 90s didn't bathe every day. That's against their norm. And the longer they have the illness, in some ways it's like they're getting younger and younger up here. I call listen with your mind's eye to where they might really be. Listen with your mind's eye and listen with your heart in order to put yourself into the shoes of where they might be in time, okay? So bathing, warm the room first, play soft music. Do you know you sing from a different part of your brain than you talk from? How many of you have loved ones that may, language may be very distorted, but they can still sing full songs? Anybody familiar with that? Full hymns. Because you sing from a different part of your brain than you talk from. So singing is a very therapeutic thing. I had this lady we took care of, um, her name was Mary, and I, she was just a dream. But getting her to bathe was something else. The hardest part was, for many times, is getting them just to go through the door, just to go through the bathroom door, right? So we did a conga line all the way in there. The staff and the residents, we just start dancing, and we would dance all the way into the bathroom. And once we got her in there, she was fine. You know, and then um, we get her in the shower, and she's like, oh, this feels so good. You know, so half the time is just finding a way that's pleasurable for them to get where you want them to go. One of the mistakes we make a lot of times getting somebody to bathe is we tell them in the wrong room. They're in their living room. We say, come on, it's time to go take a bath. Well, they're not in the right room for that activity. So it's like, hey, mom, dad, or whoever it is, come walk with me. I need your help over here. So you get them to where they need to be. That way you don't battle from point A all the way to point B. Okay? Sponge baths, keep warm after the bath and use directive language. I want you guys, when it comes to bathing, as we get older, our body temperature drops internally quite a bit, sometimes up to two degrees. So if we are adjusting water temperature based on what's comfortable to us, and we're much younger than the person we're caring for, what might feel warm to us may still feel pretty hot to them. 
Okay? So you'll know that because they'll jump in and then they might come back out and go, ouch. Okay? So just remember that adjusting water temperatures, you may have to adjust it a little bit cooler than what you like for it to be warm for them. Here's some of the disease-related behaviors. Behavioral issues are pretty hard to manage sometimes, okay? They upset the person. How many of y'all like getting mad at somebody? Is that comfortable or uncomfortable? It's uncomfortable. It's just as uncomfortable for people that have this illness when they lose their behavioral control, okay? So they upset the person, they upset the people living in the home, and they upset the caregiver. In other words, they really upset the apple cart and decrease satisfaction all the way around. What are some of the things that can cause them? Changes in the brain. This is really important. Alzheimer's disease does not stay stagnant. And it progresses to almost every part of the brain. And it can happen sometimes fast, sometimes slow. So there's always things changing going on up there. And that's hard for them. That's struggle for them. Okay, so there's changes going on up there that sometimes can be frightening for them. I, let me put it to you this way. How many of you guys ever um, stayed overnight in a hotel or at a friend's house and you spent the night and when you woke up, you looked up at the ceiling and you said, that is not my ceiling. <laughs> what is the feeling in that moment? What'd you say? Frightening. Frightening. It's like, oh my God, where am I and how did I get here? Until you recollect what happened. Folks that have this illness in the later stages may have those feelings all the time. And that's going to cause them to become anxious and upset. Okay? And what we do as caregivers, we need to go, I know that sometimes things are scary, and I'm not going to let anything happen to you. I'm going to stay with you until, until you feel safe, regardless of what might be frightening them. Okay? Because that's the need, is to feel safe. So changes in the brain, health and medical problems, I can't stress this enough, health and medical problems, if you're seeing rapid changes, make sure you ask the doctor. Urinary tract infections um, are pretty prevalent for folks that have this illness because knowing how to use appropriate hygiene after bowel movements and using the restroom become distorted. Plus, the disease process will, will begin to deplete their immune system, so it makes them much more prone to urinary tract infections, and that's going to increase their fall risk. Um, they might cause some behavioral issues, um, sleeping more, sleeping less, eating changes, and it's pretty rapid, because by, by the time you notice that behaviorally, it's, it could be fairly advanced, because they may not be able to tell you. So health and medical problems. I also want you to consider that if you're caring for somebody who has arthritis, how many of y'all have arthritis? Raise your hand. I have very, very bad arthritis. I've already had a hip fixed because of it, okay? How many of y'all have ever fallen in sleep in front of your TV like this? Right? And you wake up, and what does your hand feel like? Numb. And when you go to move it, what does it feel like? Stiff and tingling and painful. And you're like, oh my gosh, right? The folks that we're caring for, if they're old, old, it's going to be difficult for them to move quickly. It's going to be difficult for them to go from a seated to standing position and immediately take off walking. If they are in the bed and you're helping to care for them laying in the bed and you have to roll them back and forth, be thinking about potential pain. Talk to the doctor about pain control. Pay attention to what their face is telling you. Crinkled, you know, fur furrow or furrowed brow, there it is. I tried to put that word into, all three of those words into one word, didn't work very good. Okay, so health and medical problems, pay attention to that. Environmental factors, TVs going, telephones ringing, lots of people in the environment. They lose their internal filters, and so they hear everything, and it sounds like white snow. Anybody ever heard of the um, virtual dementia tour? Somebody in here has? It's a great, great, great tool. I have some at the um, Area Agency on Aging as a family caregiver. I have home sets that you can use. It comes with a CD, and, um, and it walks you through. There's some special goggles and some special things that you put on your hands, and you try to follow instructions, and it mirrors what it's like to have Alzheimer's disease, and it is absolutely eye-opening. 
I have many sets in my office that we're more than willing to, to, to lend out to you, to use. Um, it's called the virtual dementia tour. So environmental factors and then the task is too complex. Here's some things you might see, looking for a deceased loved one, <coughs> asking for somebody who's already been, who's already left us. If that's happening, that's gonna tell you that they're, if you listen with your mind's eye, that's gonna tell you they're way back in time, way back in time. And they're looking for people in the time between then and now might not be existent here at that moment. You have to think about memory like files and they're going backwards in their filing cabinets. Okay, and everything in the front of the filing cabinet may not be there at that particular moment. So they begin to look for people who aren't here anymore. And if you respond all the time, I'm sorry, your mom passed away 10, 20 years ago, what happens? What do you mean? How come nobody told me? I didn't get to go to the funeral. And then what happens 10, 15 minutes from now? What do they ask again? The same question, okay? Borrowing items. Here's my thing, if somebody's looking for somebody, why are they looking for somebody? What's the underlying feeling of that? Familiarity, safety, right? Comfortableness, fear. So I talked to him about, you know, I haven't seen your mom today or she's at the spelling bee or whatever. I mean, or, you know, at the quilting bee or whatever. And I'm like, but I'm gonna keep you safe. Because I know it's hard you can't when you can't find somebody that you love. I'm not gonna let anything happen to you. And you'll see those anxieties go down a little bit at that moment. There's many different things. Um, there's some ethical dilemmas that come along with this, okay? Not telling people the truth all the time, especially if it's the person who raised you. Never to tell a lie, right? And where do you go if you tell a lie? I don't wanna go down there, okay? So what, so some schools of thought call those things therapeutic fiblets. Have you ever heard that term? Because sometimes, if the illness is, is, is progressed to the point to where what needs to happen in that moment is to make them feel safe and comfortable in that moment because they're living in the moment, then you tell them what you need to tell them to be feel safe and secured in that moment. That's a more therapeutic approach than telling them that over and over and over again, potentially, the person they're looking for, they're never going to find. See how that's different? But that's some ethical dilemmas about that. So that's an individual decision. But I can tell you many family caregivers just finally say, I don't, telling them this just never works. So I'm not gonna keep trying to tell them the right thing. You know, they're not gonna remember it 10 minutes from now, so. Um, striking out at others, refusals to bathe, we talked about disrobing in public, anybody experience that? You know, that can happen, don't be surprised, all they know is, Sometimes, because their skin sensations can change, if their clothing's too tight, all they know is I'm uncomfortable, off goes the clothes. Clothing's too loose and it's scraping against their skin, if they're sensitive to that, the clothes might come off, okay? Just roaming in public. Not too many people, but it can happen, thank you. Medication refusals can be fairly common. I cannot tell you how many Tic Tacs I have swallowed in my lifetime. Because <laughs> remember how I tell you they'll role model what you do? I just go, you know what, I'm gonna take my vitamins, why don't you take your vitamins if you're in a home sit? here's mine and they role model. I have great breath all the time though because of the amount of Tic Tacs I've eaten. Right? Now, when it comes to medications, I am not a proponent for psychotropic medications. There are sometimes people can be so miserable and so upset for a good portion of the day. I've already started writing my care plan for when I get up there. Okay, in my care plan, to my loved one and my spouse is gonna say, I do not wanna be miserable all day. If I'm anxious all day long, give me a pill, I don't care about the consequences, because I want my moments to be happy. That's my personal belief. Maybe not anybody else's. Okay, but medications, I have found that sometimes our folks are on medications that, that may not have any kind of long-term benefit. And it becomes a risk versus risk discussion to have with physicians. What's the risk of them taking this medication versus the risk of them not taking it? For example, vitamins. You know what I mean? Um, vitamins, how big are vitamins? How many of y'all like to swallow big old horse pills? Not much. 
And as people that have this illness, they go backwards in time up here, they begin to think if they're 30 or 40 years old in their mind's eye, did they take heart medications? Did the doctors ever prescribe that? You think they took vitamins as well as we do as, the, as we get older? So what happens a lot of times, I go, my doctor's never prescribed that medication to me, right? And eventually it's like, if you think those medications are so good, you take them, right? So sometimes you have to do the risk versus risk discussion, okay? Just the most, just the stuff that they absolutely have to have. And talk to the doctors about that, okay? Hoarding, hoarding, that's where they're not wanting to put anything down, they're carrying anything around with them. I'm gonna be one of those 85-year-old ladies doing the same thing with a walker with six purses hanging over the edge. <laughs> you know, because I mean, just imagine, every time you set something down you can't find it, what are you gonna do? You're gonna hang on to every blasted bit of it, right? Uh, rummaging, that's going through things, going through drawers and that kind of stuff. I see people try to stop that behavior and I go, what is that hurting? Does that hurt anything? And most of the time the answer is no. If somebody's carrying around their pillows and their bed linens and all, who's it hurting? Is it making them feel comfortable? Yeah. So why stop it? I had a sweet, <laughs> one of my residents, really, really sweet, she loved bright, sun, bright shiny things. She wore, you know, three-inch heels. We finally had to stop that. Bright, shiny shoes. Her daughter took and helped out and got her flats and hot glued all these things on her shoes to be nice and bright and shiny, and she loved them, right? But every year at Christmas, she would undecorate our Christmas tree, all the garland, all the, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so we weren't going to get her to stop doing it, so every night we would just redecorate the Christmas tree. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but what we ended up doing is we developed what was called Moselle boxes for her. These boxes that we placed all over the house with her name on it, with all these bright, sunshiny, bright, shiny things in them. So as she went from house to house, from place to place, she would see appropriate things to rummage through. We had Mardi Gras beads in there. We had twine. We had brushes and combs and you name it. And we had them in these boxes. And that gave her a, an appropriate way in order to do the things that she needed to do. Okay? We also had a gentleman who everything landed in the water. All of his hats, his clothes, everything landed in the sink. So we just said, asked his daughter and the staff, we all brought in this big box full of hats and socks and stuff that didn't matter how often they got wet, we just threw them in the dryer. And so he would completely saturate those things, then we would replace them with dry stuff, dry them, and it was an ongoing, but he quit ruining his own clothing by doing that. So hoarding, rummaging, and catastrophic reactions. To very quickly talk about communication, I want you to think about in communication, humans rely mostly on what they see and what people's body languages are telling them, okay? What their body language is saying, much more so than the words. If your loved one's language is distorted and they're not using the same words you use anymore, if this chair becomes a libelish instead of a chair, just remember that if you're asking your loved one, go take a seat in that chair, if that's no longer a chair, in their language, they're not going to do what you ask them to do, okay? Show them what you want. Watch how what your face is saying. Very important. I encourage people, if you, ha if you are a single caregiver and nobody else is in the home, it's a little bit more difficult. If they live in a community or if you have somebody that comes over to help you sometimes and you're really having a tough moment and they're having a tough moment, tell the person you're with, I, it's time, I just really need to change face. That's the way you can tell the person that's with you that I'm kind of struggling and I'm getting, I'm, getting, I'm getting frustrated as a caregiver, so I need for you to come take over. And then they come over and go, I've been looking all over for you. Let's go get a cup of coffee or whatever the case is. And their face is totally different than yours, and you'll see behavioral issues go way down. So change face. Remember that all behavior has meaning. Use empathy at all times. Try to focus on the positive, really important. I used to tell my staff, many times what family caregivers hear are the calls that your mom fell. Your mom, I can't get you to, uh, we can't get her to take her medications. The doctor wants to change this. The doctor wants to change that. I tried to change that dynamic. Like, I want you to call when mom for the first time or dad for the first time participates after moving in in a group activity, music, or whatever the case is, um, or, or um, um, ate all of their meals for the day. Change the dynamic, because not everything's negative. Many things are positive. You just have to look for them. 
Uh, communication, use empathy at all times, focus on the positive, and there's a couple things to avoid. I'm going to skip through these two slides because I'm running out of time. These are what some caregivers have told me. I do want to pay attention a little bit to what the, and when I've run the early stage support groups, these are some things that people have told me. Drats, I know I just had that object. Y'all ever feel that way? God, I just put that down. Where did it go? Right? What was I looking for? go back. There it is. I know someone took my things. I can't find them. Someone stole them. And if you don't know where you put them, you have no recall that you did it, you're going to think somebody else did it. Right? The last one's really hard. Even sometimes when family caregivers have been there two hours ago because of the short-term memory loss, sometimes our folks don't recall that. So they can be kind of lonely. Gee whiz, I used to know the name of that thing in my bob. That ever, you ever get worried about yourself sometimes when you go into the store and you see that person and you're like, I know that person, but golly, I can't remember that name. Right? Don't get worried. It takes many, many different things before you get diagnosed. Okay. It happens to all of us. Here's some guidelines I want you all to remember about. Know their abilities. Remember what I said that some mornings they can do something, some by the afternoon it may be a little different, but the next day it might be. Again, because it's kind of like this for them. How many of y'all remember gym school? I mean, in school, when you um, mem you remember flow charts, where you start off with a task, and then you, if you follow this area, and you get a yes answer, and you follow this area, and you get a no answer, and then eventually you follow all the ones until you get down to whatever you're trying to solve. Alzheimer's and related dementia sometimes between the different steps of things like toothbrushing will erase the next arrow. So from this step to that next step, that arrow's gone. But the next time you ask them to do the same thing, that arrow's there. That's what I mean by this way. So sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Use non-demanding approach. Humor goes a long way. Laughter soothes the soul. It's okay to laugh sometimes. Turn excessive noisemakers off. Really hard for them to follow instructions or to really hear you if there's lots of noise in the environment. Move slowly. It takes a long time for information to go through. I had to learn how to walk slower and talk slower. I could pass somebody down the hallway with this illness and say, hey, Bob, it's nice to see you this morning. I was down the hall and around the corner when Bob's going, what just happened? Okay, so I really had to slow myself down. I was startling people because we get going fast. Okay? Use directive language. Sometimes if you ask people, are you ready to take your bath? What answer are you going to get? No. Sometimes not very nicely either. Right? Instead of, you know what? It's time to go take a bath. Okay? You can say that with love and not being like, you have to go take a bath now. There's a big difference between those three statements. Okay? Introduce yourself every time. As a family caregiver, that's not very easy. But if you haven't seen your loved one for a while, or you're visiting them at a facility and just go, hey, Dad, it's, it's, you know, it's Jennifer, I'm your daughter. That helps them to be successful and orients them a little bit. What we end up doing sometimes is saying, hi, Dad. And Dad goes, I haven't seen you in a long time. Well, I was just here yesterday. Do you remember? Okay. Introduce yourself. Eye-level approach is important. Speak slowly and softly. Unless they wear hearing aids like I do, then sometimes you have to yell at me. Avoid jargon. You know what I mean by jargon? Words have many different meanings, depending on the situation. When I was a child growing up, if I did something bad, you know that B-A-D word? It means I was in trouble with my parents. When I was in high school, now I'm really dating myself, when I was in high school, if I did something bad, I did something really great. I was rad. I mean, I was the cool kid on the block, right? Because I was bad. As I got older, when I went to work, if I did something bad, I was in trouble with my boss. So just that one three-letter word has gone through lots of iterations of different meanings. We have to remember that when we're talking with our loved ones. If you tell them, go around the corner and you'll find your bedroom, the word around in concrete terms, you've told them to go around, okay, instead of around. Okay, so if they're not following what you ask them to do, sometimes change the way you're asking. 
So avoid jargon. Never argue your power struggle. There really is so little that we ever have to power in our, unless there's a life safety issue involved. I like this slide because this is what you see on the outside. The people that we love. The people that we cherish. And sometimes in the beginning of the illness, in the middle of the illness, they don't, you can't tell. But you have to remember as a caregiver that there are changes going on. There are changes going on up there. I just squeeze them, you know? We have to be patient, we have to love them all, at all times. Here's some resources for you. We're gonna open it up for questions and answers. Be sure to, Alzheimer's Texas, be sure to come. They have wonderful, wonderful, wonderful support programs for family caregivers, they are free. Please be sure to um, get with them. Uh, from lending libraries to lunch and learns and all kinds of stuff, Department of Aging and Disability Services, I run the Aging and Disability Resource Center as well as the Area Agency on Aging. Uh, I have 31 different in-home support services that we provide that do not cost. We are short-term services to help family caregivers get over the hump. We have respite. I want to point out this last one on your slide, Take Time Texas. I cannot tell you the value of respite care for, for yourselves. Okay, respite care, get a break, schedule a break, tell your loved ones you need a break, and don't and let's go, you know, it'd be great if you can come over this week because I need a break. What you need to do is say, I need for you to come over on Wednesday at 11 o'clock because I need a break, schedule it, okay? Please take a break, get some respite care. It's really important, a tired caregiver finds it very difficult to give care over the long haul. Y'all, any questions? And again, remember, I'm part of...